Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending where you are. And welcome to today's Future of Financial Information webinar. It's my great pleasure to welcome Alex Edmonds from London Business School, our speaker, as well as Alok Kumar from the University of Miami, who will give the discussion. So the format, as usual, uh, Alex will present for about 30 minutes, uh, followed by Alok's discussion for about 15 minutes, uh, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. And if you have some questions for the Q&A, you can also uh, put them in the chat so that uh, we don't miss them later and, and we'll come back to that. So the topic for today, music sentiment and stock returns around the world. So Alex, please, the screen is yours for 30 minutes. Great. Thanks so much, Michael, for, for inviting me. And thank you to everybody for joining. I know there's tons of webinars that you can join right now. So thank you for um, spending up and uh, spending an hour to um, hear uh, this paper. So I think a good place to start is just to introduce um, my co-authors. So there's um, Adrian Fernandez Perez from Auckland, Alexandra Garrel from Audencia, and Ivan Andreawan from Auckland. And um, I believe that many or all of them will be on the call right now. So the title of the paper is Music, Sentiment and Stock Returns Around the World. So what it does is it correlates a measure we call music sentiment to stock returns. Now, some uh, answer, some reactions we might get is, can you really be serious? So why are you even doing this to begin with? And that has been a reaction I had with the very first paper that I wrote, which was linking soccer to stock returns. But what I want to stress here is that this is going after a serious academic question. Yes, it's fun to write a paper about music, but what is the underlying academic question we're trying to study here? It does sentiment affect the stock market? And I think this is a fundamental question because it affects the efficiency of stock prices, the profitability of trading strategies. If we find alpha, is this likely to be due to mispricing or mismeasured risk and so forth? Now, clearly, this is not a new question. Many people, including people on this call, including my discussant, have asked this question. And, and many of the approaches take the following um, flavour. So what you do is you specify a variable that you think shocks sentiment, and then you assume that it affects the marginal investor. And the assumption here is not just based on introspection, you're often drawing from the psychology literature to find what are the types of shocks to sentiment that really matter for most people. And so there's a number of, pa of papers here which do this. So um, there's two papers in the AEO by Camps, Kramer and Levy, one looking at clock changes. Like why is that reasonable? When the clock changes, it disrupts your sleep. And obviously sleep is important for mood. There's daylight saving and that they believed was important because many people suffer from seasonal affective disorder. Uh, perhaps the best known um, mood variables are weather. So one of the big advantages that you have of weather rather than clock changes, is that clock changes only happen twice a year, whereas weather is something which is continuous. And so Hirschleifer and Shumway study this, also Alec Kramami discussed and did so with some, some co-authors. And then the first paper that I've written on this topic, in fact, the only paper I've written on this topic until today, was one where we looked at the effect of soccer results. And so why did we choose soccer? Well, that is something which has a large sudden effect on investor mood. Importantly, it's correlated across the country. So when England loses a game, which often happens, the entire of England will get depressed and might be um, willing to sell stocks, whereas something like daylight that might not be correlated across the country, particularly if you're in different time zones. And finally, there's this paper on aviation disasters, again, a big effect to sentiment. And obviously, these approaches are successful approaches, and they've led to a number of top publications. But there are some potential concerns, which is it's not clear how much these variables might actually affect sentiment. For example, there is a lot of evidence that many people suffer from seasonal affective disorder. But are the people who self-select into becoming traders and institutional investors, those types of people, they may well be but it's not clear. And even picking on my own measure of sports results, yes, maybe the average person might be affected by soccer, but maybe the marginal investor may not. So that does require an assumption, right? Obviously the psychology literature finds that people in general are affected by these mood variables, but that might not be the subset of people who are trading shares. 
And also uh, the concern is that while these events are low frequency for some of them, again, picking on my own research with sports results, you only have international competitions once every four years for football or maybe once every two years if you take the European Championship into account. And for some other measures like weather and so on, this might not be correlated within a country. It could be sunny in New York City, but it could be cloudy in Chicago and it could be Chicago fund managers are trading stocks. So I think while we have a lot to, that we've learned from these exogenous measures of sentiment, that does require the assumption that this measure indeed affects the mood of investors. So the approach that we're taking here is that we would like a measure of the actual sentiment of investors. So how do people actually feel, not what are the shocks that may affect how they feel? And so by studying what we will try to call is closer to actual sentiment, that is driven by a variety of events. So there could be tons of things going on in the world. It could be that you've lost a soccer game, but on the other hand, it might well be that it's a sunny day and maybe the days are getting longer, which happens during the World Cup and so forth. And if we're looking at a measure of actual mood, that could be the product of all of those different exogenous shocks. And also there might be many other things that the econometrician just doesn't have access to. So it could be that there's good things going on at work or your personal life and so on. So if we try to get a measure which is closest as possible to actual sentiment, that's going to be more comprehensive than looking at one specific shock. So what we'd like to have is an endogenous measure of sentiment, which reflects people's feelings rather than an exogenous measure that affects it. Now, it's really nice to present to this audience because my normal audience is corporate finance. And if you mention endogenous, you're going to deliberately choose something endogenous, right? People will just shut off their Zoom and just go somewhere else, right? You will get slammed for claiming that you're going to use something endogenous. But here, why we do actually want something endogenous is if indeed a person's mood is then reflected in his or her behaviour, we could use that behaviour or use those choices at least as a, a, a approximate proxy for how they are feeling. Now, there are many ways in which um, there might be some um, negative, in which negative feelings might manifest. You might start swearing or kicking the cat or rejecting somebody's paper or so forth. We're not going to have variables on that. So instead, what we're going to try and do is to have a relatively novel measure of sentiment. And so it's great to have the opportunity to present in this seminar, which is trying to use uh, new types of data. And this is something that entirely I should get zero credit for because it was my co-authors who, who came up with this idea, which is to look at the music that people choose to listen to. So why are there some potential advantages of that? So there is existing research in the psychology literature finding that the music that people choose to listen to generally reflects their mood. So this is something known as emotion congruity, where if you're happy, right, you tend to listen to happy mood. If you're sad, let's say a funeral, you tend to listen to, to sad music. But also what's really important is, is this something observable to the econometrician? And the answer is yes, as I will explain shortly, it's something that you can get through Spotify. They will release um, data on the most streamed songs. And the important thing about music is that it's something where we can study it across the world. So to have a global measure of sentiment is really important so that you can do cross-country analyses. And indeed, that was the strength of many of these papers out here. Now, there have been, again, other approaches to sentiment, which might be doing things such as looking at Google searches and so on. And those, again, have been published in good papers and good journals. But one potential limitation with something that relies on language is that you need algorithms in order to try to diagnose, are these words positive or negative? And it may well be that uh, the accuracy of the algorithm varies across languages and therefore your measure of sentiment is not comparable. And also it may well be that um, people have emotions which they don't express into words. It might be that somebody is happy or sad, but that's reflected in the music choices, but they're not necessarily going to be typing something in, into Google. So that's why we're going to try to look at this. Now, with music sentiment, 
there are clearly many imperfections in the measure. This, this is far from a perfect measure, and we acknowledge this. So one, one concern might be, yes, you do have some literature on emotion congruity, but there are a few papers also that suggest, well, maybe music is a neutralizer. It might be that you feel depressed and actually you choose to listen to happy music in order to make you more upbeat. So it's clear that that doesn't happen at, at most funerals, but it might be in other circumstances that you might actually listen to music which is opposite to your mood. So one of the things that we will need to do is to validate the measure. Is it indeed correlated with changes in sentiment in the way uh, that we're suggesting? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing this here in terms of Michael's question. Exactly, that's one of the major concerns. And that one at least we can address. One thing that we cannot address um, is some a limitation also suffered by my soccer paper and other papers is that while we can observe the music listened to by the average person or the population in aggregate, we can't look at the music listened to by uh, the traders in particular, right? We only have average measures here. And obviously we, we do, we gather data showing that these are um, people who are, are not actually just teenagers, as you might think. There's quite a lot of young professionals which listen to Spotify and so forth, but we do need to make the assumption that um, the investor universe is at least roughly represented in the Spotify Spotify listening database, because if we don't, then we don't have that good a measure. But that is also something that is suffered by prior literature. We need to assume that serious people who trade stocks are affected by things like soccer results. Okay, so let me now get into the data. So um, Spotify um, releases, um, since the start of 2017, the 200 most streamed songs for a particular country on a particular day. And it's available for 70 countries around the world. We can only have 40, which we can link to MSCI indices for the entire time period, but that's still a nice cross section. Now, a concern here is that sometimes Spotify might suggest songs. So it ends up being that somebody passively listens to a song just because it is in the Spotify playlist and this doesn't actually um, reflect their mood. But what is nice is that a stream is counted if it is played for at least 30 seconds. So if you listen to the start of a song and then you skip it because it doesn't match your mood, then you can um, actually end up just not um, listening to it. Um, and I think um, this is something that Ilya is mentioning um, as, as well. OK, now, well, how do we then assess the positivity of this? What's, what um, Spotify also releases is the valence of a song, which is how positive it is. And so how do they come up with this? Well, what they had was a number of experts uh, rate the positivity of a sample of songs. And then this was extended with machine learning to be ex um, to be applicable to all songs. So using this algorithm that they trained on particular experts, they're now able to diagnose the positivity or negativity of songs in general. And the important thing here is that it measures the positivity of the songs, not necessarily the lyrics. And why is that important? Well, what really affects the mood is the overall music. Lyrics are only some part of this. And it may well be that some of the songs that are the most upbeat actually have quite depressing uh, lyrics. So um, before um, every class, and actually during um, every class that I teach, I play music. My lectures are so boring that I need to do this to get students to be awake. And, and one of the songs I play is Time of Your Life um, by Green Day, which is actually a really sad song despite being so upbeat. Another one is Semi-Charmed Life by Third Eye Blind. Again, if you're going to read the lyrics there, you might get quite depressed, but they are quite positive songs here. And so that's why we choose to look at the overall valence rather than a textual analysis of, of, of the words. And just to give you an example, um, the top song for the US is Earth, Wind and Fire, it was a September by Earth, Wind and Fire. Uh, the bottom song is Legion Inoculant by Tool. And, and Michael did ask me, or maybe I'm going to be playing some music clips and why I said I'm not going to, is I don't want to depress people uh, by playing at least um, the second song. Now back to the more serious stuff. What are we going to do in order to try to measure um, the sentiment of the country? I've told you that we've got the top 200 songs. 
and we also have the valence of each song. So what we're now trying to do is to have a stream weighted average variance, because obviously there'll be some variation in the plays within the top 200. And so what we're going to do is to weight the valence of each song by the number of times that they're played in a particular street. Okay. And then to our measure of music sentiment is going to be the change in that from one day uh, to the last day. And so we're quite um, unoriginally calling that music sentiment, the change in the stream weighted average valence. Now, one of the concerns, and this came up in Michael's point, which is a very valid one, is yes, there is some evidence on um, emotion congruity, but maybe you're using music as a um, antidepressant. So what we do is we try to link music sentiment to other prior events that the literature has found to be negatively or positively affected by sentiment. So um, there's research on the months of the year, because it could be that certain months involve lengthening days or shortening dates. We have the deseasonalized cloud cover measure of Hirschleifer and Shumway and others. And one thing that is not in prior literature, but was something that certainly affected our emotions through writing this um, paper, is a extent, uh, is a um, sorry, index of COVID lockdown restrictions. So when there were lockdowns imposed, which restricted people from doing their daily business, that was something that indeed led to negative mood. And so this is something that we're indeed finding for most of the um, coefficients here in the sample. So we find that if there are greater COVID restrictions, um, falls in sunshine and negative mood, right, they are typically negatively linked to our music sentiment measure, we don't have anything for positive uh, months, so we'll just admit defeat on that one and concede that one to the data, but at least these three here seem to be consistent with our idea, our idea that there is generally emotion congruity. So let me get to the results. So this is the first result here. And so what we're doing, our main analyses will be a weekly analysis. And so why are we doing this weekly? It's because, well, you do have the days which are given by Spotify, but it may be that certain markets are leading that actual day or certain markets are lagging it. So we're going to just look at music sentiment on a weekly basis. And what we find is that um, controlling for other determinants of what might be driving the work, the stock market index of a country on a given day, such as the world return, volatility, various other controls, when a country has positive music sentiment, so people are choosing to listen to more positive music, then indeed we do find an increase in the local index. And then we find in the next week that there is a reversal, so um, there is a bouncing back, so this is consistent with the idea that there could be some temporary sentiment-induced um, overpricing, which then reverses itself. And that is indeed consistent with the soccer paper, where we found some bounce back effects um, over the next uh, few days after a soccer defeat. Okay, so we did a couple of robustness tests here. So one was in terms of local currency returns in case there were effects on exchange rates. One is removing one country at a time to address the concerns that we have the results driven too much by one particular country. One here, and this might be somewhat related to Ilya's question, is to remove the 50 most streamed songs. Why is that? Well, I mentioned that they're particular, say, recommendations. So if you're somebody who likes listening to electronic dance music, then it's going to recommend you other playlists on that. But there's going to be a particular set of recommendations, which is called the hot hits of Spotify, where they will be recommending to you the 50 most played or 50 most up and coming and breaking hits. And it might be that people just click on them. Again, this is partially addressed by the fact that you need to listen to a song for at least 30 seconds, but maybe you can do more to that. So what we can do is we can take out the 50 most streamed songs. Notice here that that's not perfectly the same as the hot hits. Well, they, we don't actually have historic data on the hot hits. The hot hits aren't necessarily the 50 most stream songs. It could be maybe the 25 most stream songs and some which are up and coming. But when we use that as a proxy, 
we also find that the results are there. And we also look at daily returns here because while I've explained why we look at weekly returns, you might have a concern, well, maybe there's some reverse causality going on here. It might be that at the start of the week, you're buying shares and then at the end of the week, you are sort of listening to more positive music. So when we look at daily returns, we find that after we have people listening to more positive music on a particular day, the next day, the local index typically will go up. Okay, so further things that we want to do are the following. So if indeed there is a sentiment story, we might expect sentiments to have a greater effect when there's limits to arbitrage. So one of the, the concerns with the paper is that we don't have that long a time series. It starts in 2017. We rely a lot on the cross section. But what we do have in our time series were various trading restrictions. So there were short selling bans um, in response to the COVID crisis and Yale Programme for Financial Stability kind of tracks that. And also in Australia, they uh, they introduced um, some trading volume limits there, which also reduces arbitrage's ability to correct misprices. So what we find here in terms of the um, interaction between ban or restrictions and music sentiment is that this interaction term is positive both with and without controls, which suggests that the effect of sentiment is even stronger in times when there are bans. Now, one of the weaknesses of this is these coefficients are huge. So this interaction term, I wish it was not so big. Normally you like to have significant results. And what we've tried to do is to look at, well, why is this so big? Is it driven by some outliers? What happens when we drop one country at a time? We have unfortunately found that this result is robust. We wish we could make it go away and be weaker, but this does seem to be something which is quite robust. So at least it seems that there was a large effect of the short sale bans on the ability to arbitrage and therefore the impact of sentiment. Okay, so now what we want to do is to look at more quotes out of sample dependent variables. So we looked at the effect on asset prices the level, but if indeed there is some um, effect on, on sentiment, this is also going to be manifesting in trading vol volatility, which is also something that um, prior research has found, including my, my soccer paper. So what we look at here is absolute music sentiment. So not the signed level, but if there's changes in sentiment in both directions, this should lead to trading. And indeed what we're finding here is we find this significant effect here. And economic significance, I apologize, I forgot to say this for the prior results, but a one standard deviation increase in music sentiment is associated with higher volatility of 3.7 basis points. So that's economically significant, it's statistically significant, it's economically somewhat meaningful, but it's not huge. So compared to the weekly average volatility, it's 3.5% of that, which is sort of in the reasonable ballpark. It's something that does matter. It's not just we've got statistical significance due to the power of data, but it's also something which is not so large as to be potentially implausible. And that's the same for our main results. I apologize for forgetting to say this. A one standard deviation increase in music sentiment is associated with an eight basis point higher return this week and seven basis points lower next week. Okay. Other things that we want to look at are the following. So mutual fund flows um, are also something which might be affected by sentiment. And here again, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, which uh, prior research finds that when people are in a happy mood, not only are they buying more individual stocks, but they might also be putting their money into equity mutual funds. And so we get that data here from Morningstar, and we look at sentiment here, not just contemporaneously, but also lagged sentiment, because prior research finds that time is needed to settle these flows and report on these flows. And indeed, using the same control variables here, what we do find is contemporaneous and lagged weekly music sentiment is positively correlated with equity mutual fund flows, which suggests that when um, people are in a more positive mood, not only might be the, they be buying individual stocks, but also going into mutual funds. So finally, we have a bit of a, a falsification test here, is that if indeed we have a um, this idea of a flight to safety, when sentiment is high, people will be going into stocks and people will be going into equity mutual funds, 
but what might people be going out of? And the answer might be potentially safe assets such as government bonds. And so that's something which is documented by prior research in the first bullet point. What we look at here is the data stream at benchmark government bond index with a five-year maturity. Why? Because prior research found that the five-year maturity one is the one which is traded the most. And indeed, what we find is uh, a negative effect of sentiment on government bond prices. So in terms of economic significance, a one standard deviation improvement in sentiment, people becoming happier, leads to a lower return of 0.009 basis points per week. That seems not much, but it's minus half a percent per year when you uh, annualize that versus the mean return of 2.2%. So again, this suggests it's something which is not economically tiny, but it's not so large as to potentially be implausible. Okay, so in conclusion, and I'm going to end a little bit early. So what we're doing here is to propose music sentiment as a mood measure. And yes, it's fun to write about music and just like soccer. This is something I personally like just outside of my finance life. But, but this is not why we write the paper. It's something which is a measure of mood, but a quite different measure to what we have before. Right? We already have tons of exogenous measures that shock mood. This is not yet another exogenous measure of mood. In fact, it's an endogenous measure. And while that obviously does have some limitations, right, we do have the concern that Michael mentioned, is this something where you're using music as a neutralizer? It does have some potential advantages, which is regardless of what you are affected by, which affects your mood, soccer results or weather, your papers being accepted or whatever, right, this is something which you might be using to reflect your emotions overall. It's something which is continuous. So papers like the soccer paper show that extreme events like being eliminated from the World Cup do lead to stocks going down. But continuous measures shows that even if your sentiment changes by small amounts and is reflected in your music choices, that could also be linked to stock returns. It's language free. So it's something which is particularly um, comparable across countries, it doesn't rely on a consistent accuracy of the bag of words that you choose to be positive or negative. And so that's the motivation for it. What, would you, what do you find um, in terms of the validation? It is correlated with many prior variables known to be negative indicators of sentiment. And then in terms of the actual results, what we find is it's associated with higher contemporaneous returns and lower next week returns suggesting temporary mispricing higher volatility, uh, equity mutual fund inflows, and lower government bond returns. Thank you very much to everybody for their attention and for the interaction already through the chat. Yes, thank you very much, Alex, for the very upbeat presentation. And indeed, we will get back to these questions. But first, let me hand over to Alok uh, Kumar for the discussion. So, Alok, you have 15 minutes. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so, uh, let me, uh, one second. Okay, so thank you, Alex, for this enlightening presentation. Uh, I guess uh, I should be listening to some good music now, you know, <laughs> feeling happy of, uh, following your presentation. So let's, uh, so uh, I'm going to not uh, focus on the nitty gritty details of the paper. Uh, you know, the evidence is, is interesting. You know, I, I don't have any uh, concern with the, you know, I, I guess other than the minor point that which you already mentioned that the time period is short. I mean, there's, I don't have any major issue with the analysis. It's more of the interpretation and, you know, and how does this fit in the big picture of this uh, research related to sentiment and what's the incremental contribution of this paper? So those are the things that I will, uh, focus on. So my in initial reaction when you sent me the paper some time back, even before uh, I was asked to discuss the paper was that yes, it's an interesting, thought provoking paper, fun to read. And unlike many of your other uh, uh, sort of the reaction you got from other people that well, this research is quote unquote, weird, or you know, strange, I didn't have that reaction. It was like, okay, it's, th it's, it's thought provoking. And Anyway, so, uh, and to me, it made sense to look at, you know, if, if, if the goal is to capture people's emotions, because eventually that's what you want to get to, 
uh, you know, whatever is reflecting those emotions directly, you know, if I'm smiling, if I could somehow measure, for example, just like Google Maps, if uh, I open my, I, uh, my smartphone and it takes a picture of my face and gives sort of uh, 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 a scale of, you know, happiness to unhappiness, and we somehow aggregate this data and, and come up with a measure of, I don't know, happiness level per city uh, or per region, that would be quite interesting. But unfortunately, we can't get to that. So using these other uh, in, somewhat indirect approaches make sense to me, that do make sense. So anyway, uh, I guess you have already summarized the results, but I just wanted to uh, highlight that these are the three things, you know, I think the broad result is sentiment generates some kind of mispricing that slowly uh, gets corrected uh, over the next uh, 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 in the future. And this is the standard, you know, mispricing correction paradigm that, you know, people have looked at uh, in the past. Uh, clearly, arbitrage plays a role. So limits to arbitrage could make the effect of sentiment stronger or weaker, depending upon how it plays. And then you have some additional results related to, you know, mutual fund flows, volatility, and uh, bond returns. So my initial uh, reaction was, what exactly is balance capturing? And uh, I also tried to go to Spotify website to see what it's uh, really capturing. Your paper uh, does provide some description, uh, but since this is one of the key ingredients uh, or, you know, key ideas, I think it makes sense to understand what exactly is this valence measure capturing. You said, uh, you know, experts rate these songs and, and then there is a machine learning algorithm that try to, you know, uh, 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 capture uh, uh, the behavior of these experts, so to speak, because, you know, that's how it's going to be trained. So experts, uh, experts sort of uh, say this is a happy song, sad song or whatever. And then you have other songs where you don't know the rating. And then you train maybe a neural network or you train some other machine learning algorithm. And it just maps from features to two categories, good, bad, happy, sad, or whatever. Maybe it's continuous, whatever it is. I mean, so those methods are pretty standard. In fact, uh, uh, I guess maybe I should mention that before I came into the world of finance, almost 30 years ago, I was studying robotics and AI. That was my main uh, area of research. And I, I moved away from it because I thought it's too hard. It's not interesting anymore. And then now I'm seeing that there's a resurgence of uh, this whole field. Uh, and I'm also trying to jump onto that bandwagon again because that was my quote unquote first love anyway. So, you know, I really enjoyed doing that. And, now I'm trying to get back to it. So yes, I completely agree that, uh, you know, this method would work, but knowing exactly what is happening rather than saying machine learning, whatever these methods do it, to me, that was not uh, 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 sufficient. And if probably you don't have information on it, but knowing a little bit more would be useful. Also, again, is, are these scores country specific? Because, a, you know, a song could be a happy song in country A, but I don't know, maybe it's not such a happy song in some other country uh, or the, at least the magnitude. Okay, so uh, it wasn't clear to me. Uh, and and, and uh, another idea is that, you know, listening to the same song could generate different emotions in different countries based on, you know, the culture, based on uh, 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 the people and so on. So it's not at all obvious how to interpret this balance measure without knowing all these things. Okay, so that is uh, other thought was that, you know, what are the experts doing? Are they looking at the, are they just, what are they looking at? Are they looking at the lyrics? Are they looking at, uh, you know, what features of the song are they sort of, you know, uh, uh, implicitly using to classify them as happy or, so, uh, or sad? I don't know. I mean, that would be uh, uh, I'm not a music expert. I enjoy music, but at least it's not at all obvious to me. So how this is done. Anyway, so, so that's uh, one thing. The other thought I had was uh, how exactly does this music sentiment measure uh, uh, relate to other sentiment measures? You have some, of course, you're looking at 
uh, these as validation tests, but I was also thinking more in terms of uh, competing with other measures. What is it really capturing? Is it, uh, is it better than other sentiment measures? If we have a, 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 a sort of, a, 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 we do a kind of a horse race or, you know, is it capturing, what is it capturing? Is it capturing something additional to those measures, uh, incremental or, you know, uh, 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 or if that's the case, then maybe looking at the residual sentiment measure, you know, whatever is explained by others, is, it, is this measure capturing something more? It would be good to know. Either way, it would be good to know. But again, I didn't see uh, uh, these things, uh, at least not in the early version, uh, versions of the paper, but it would be something that can be uh, easily uh, looked at. Uh, then the question that you kind of uh, highlighted something uh, a little bit talked about is whose sentiment is it capturing? You know, and which, whose sentiment do we want to, uh, this to capture? So you talked about, you know, maybe uh, uh, ideally you would like the sent, we would like to capture the sentiment of marginal traders, in this case, what are we thinking? Are we thinking that this, uh, again, the standard story would be, it's a noise trader sentiment that generates this kind of mispricing. So presumably we want to capture their sentiment. Uh, and I wasn't sure uh, how to think about this uh, uh, in this context. I know it's very hard and other sentiment measures have the same problem. But uh, in the case of music, I was just thinking if there is some data that uh, it's it's uh, uh, that could uh, uh, be used to validate this a little bit more about to, uh, to to better understand whose sentiment might it be capturing. So, for example, you know we also know who sent or we I don't know if we know, but it's likely not to capture the sentiment of some groups of investors. Uh, again, if we think Spotify captures mostly uh, younger and middle-aged. Uh, people, then maybe it doesn't capture the sentiment of, let's say, older investors, for example. And if that is true, then maybe if there are all these sentiment-based catering stories, maybe in those cases, if you look at the effect of, let's say, music sentiment on corporate policies, for example, maybe we shouldn't find anything. Uh, so if even that non-result to me would be uh, interesting. Uh, other thought I had was that maybe you look at, do some Amazon, you know, simple survey on Amazon Mechanical Turk and ask people of different uh, demographic groups to rank their songs and see if, if, if uh, a sentiment of certain groups of individuals, certain types of investors, or in this case, individuals who may be investors are more correlated with Spotify measures because I don't know, Spotify, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's sort of, you know, uh, 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 how should I say? Its presence in every country is not the same. Its penetration in every demographic groups is not the same. For example, my kids listen to Spotify. I don't do it much as much. So maybe I'm, uh, you know, so uh, all I'm saying is that uh, it's not a universal music listening tool. And, 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 and so uh, uh, maybe there are some limitations. Uh, Again, this is more like a wish list. I don't know if the, you know is, is finer level data available or not. You know, to me, maybe country level seems a little bit too coarse. Although you know, I mean, the results are very interesting. But maybe state level, maybe MSA level, maybe some way of, uh, or maybe different demographic groups to better understand. You know, because music preference, as I said, could also be uh, could vary with these groups. And if we don't know who's uh, 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 whose sentiment it is capturing, the aggregate might be a little bit uh, difficult to interpret. So maybe having these uh, uh, measures of sentiment at, at a finer level could be helpful. And if that's available, then you can also potentially uh, compute a firm level of sentiment, uh, a firm level sentiment measure or industry level, because based on the ownership data where and where those people are located, perhaps it's possible to get, uh, you know, whether Google investors are feeling more optimistic today than let's say Apple uh, uh, investors and so on. And, and maybe uh, those types of firm level or industry level measures could also be uh, interesting. Okay, one potential concern, which I'm, I, of course you already know, uh, is that I thought the idea 
in the in the preliminary paper and this one was very similar and this i just look at the description from these two papers so uh, of course three of the four co-authors uh, uh, and the paper are from the previous paper uh, so i was just thinking how should we think about the current paper is it the international version of the original paper is it robust evidence of uh, 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 provided for the original paper new results should we focus more on the new results whatever stance you take or maybe all three uh, uh, I think some more clarity on this upfront would be uh, uh, would be helpful. Uh, this is again minor concern. Why focus on music sentiment? I mean, maybe you should justify the choice a little bit more, because there are other potential candidates, and you know, uh, maybe social media activity, not the text, but maybe emotions captured on these uh, different uh, uh, media platforms. Social media platforms could be useful. Uh, other things are also maybe available for a longer time series, still high frequency uh, and so on. Uh, the other thought I had was that, you know, uh, you, you, you describe some of the limitations of the text-based methods, which I completely agree, but uh, as more of these AI and machine learning tools become uh, more powerful, I think uh, they may be able to uh, infer the emotions or the context specific information more effectively and maybe uh, they they will be able to uh, measure the uh, emotion or, or potential uh, 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 of course it still leaves the, uh, uh, the question of whether these articles are indeed uh, affecting investor sentiment or not i completely agree with uh, that limitation but maybe these as they become better given that they are available for a very long time series uh, you know, like, for example, you can go to New York Times article in the last 100 years. So I think uh, uh, it would be, it would be useful, these methods would still uh, uh, be useful in the future. And, and maybe just, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the measure that you are proposing uh, would be a complement. And I think you agree with that. I think at least uh, based on the discussion in the paper, that is true. But uh, I, I think maybe uh, 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 in my mind, at least, I would not completely rule out these uh, text-based uh, methods. So concluding thoughts is fun paper, provides a new path for research and investor sentiment and pricing. Extensions of this paper may provide uh, uh, new insights into corporate decisions as well, especially catering ideas because they rely on, you know, this kind of time varying investor sentiment as well. Of course, it's looking at sentiment maybe of certain types of investors and so on. I think paper needs a bit, I wasn't wowed by the paper. Uh, I think it needs to do a bit more work to generate a wow reaction, but this is doable. And you know, some of the suggestions I made and I'm sure you have other thoughts uh, 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 yourself. So I look forward to reading the next uh, version of the paper. Hey, thank you very much, Alok. And uh, I wanna say I really like your use of color to elicit emotions <laughs> in your discussion. Uh, so, Alex, would you like to take a minute or two to respond to, to any of the comments? Only just to say thank you. I, I think those, those were a great set of comments. I think they're really actionable, which is which is what's particularly helpful. Um, I, I don't think I, I, I'd rather not respond to individual points because I think they're, they're all good ones. I'd rather maximize the time for questions from, from the audience. Absolutely. Uh, let me thank Alex and Alec, Alok one more time uh, for, your, for uh, joining and for contributing to the webinar series. It was a great uh, session today. And um, as Alex pointed out, uh, spot on for the, for the topic. Um, before you all disconnect, just let me uh, remind you that in two weeks, uh, we will have uh, our last um, webinar with uh, Marina Nisner from Yale University talking about uh, disagreements and, and trading. Uh, and exactly four weeks from now, we will have our annual Future of Financial Information Conference. So that's a three-day event with uh, 22 papers, uh, poster session, keynote um, lectures. So um, quite a lot of exciting stuff still ahead of us before we uh, retire for the summer. So make sure to uh, stay on top uh, and check the website footfin.info for all the information uh, and in the meantime uh, have a great rest of your day 